Rainier Arms brings you this episode of the QA. It is the last Monday of the month, the end of the month, which means it is time for the QA. My name is Dave Tim. Thank you very much for spending a few minutes of your day checking out this video for Guns and Tactics. If you like the content, make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and also check us out online, gunsandtactics.com. Before we get into the questions, I am publishing this video on Memorial Day 2020. So before we get into that, let's take a moment to really remember what Memorial Day is about. It is about the lost brave men and women that our armed forces have lost in all sorts of different conflicts around the world, whether fighting for our own freedoms or for the freedoms of others. Memorial Day is to honor those who are not coming back. And while I am also very, very thankful for veterans and our current members of our armed forces, Memorial Day is really about the lost. And for a lot of people, this is a sad holiday. Many of you might be barbecuing or camping or kicking off summer, but for a lot of people, it's a reminder that their brother or sister, husband or wife, son or daughter, mom or dad isn't coming home. They're visiting a cemetery full of brave men and women. And it's a very uh, real reminder that they're never gonna come back. So really remember the fallen. I'm very thankful that we had brave men and women willing to go do uh, whatever was asked of them to defend our rights, our freedoms, or for others. I mean, so many of our conflicts involve other countries as well, invigorating and trying to liberate and free other um, people as, uh, around the world. So it's uh, a very, very realistic reminder of what today really is about. So I hope you guys take a moment to remember what Memorial Day is about, and I hope uh, you are thankful for their sacrifice as I am. If you want to see your question get on the show, the best way is to email us. You can go ahead and email us at the email address shown below, which is the QA at gunsandtactics.com. I do check that. I add them to a folder, and that folder gets added to the show for the episode at the end of the month. You can also leave comments. I love engaging with comments. I try to respond to as many as I can, but the best way is the email address. So I do appreciate it if you email in your questions. As a side note, I'm filming this little segment after I got done. If you're enjoying a beverage with this show, go ahead and take a drink every time I say the word chipmunk. When I was filming this, there was literally all these chipmunks running around and they have been causing nothing but havoc. They've been burrowing under my deck, they've been damaging the kids' stuff. So I am actually also on chipmunk patrol during this episode with my uh, little 1022 charger with some birdshot, which works very well. With that, let's quick do a comment cleanup. Did get a few comments last year about my flip-flops, and uh, I'm not wearing socks this time. But yeah, these are my colors. I like dark gray and lime green. It's my favorite colors, so deal with it. Lance wants to see a parody video. Yeah, maybe. We'll see what we can do. I don't know who I could paradise, but we'll think of something maybe. And uh, yeah, so just some other nice comments, so I do appreciate it. Again, and as I've said before, you guys, uh, we don't get a ton of views on the QA. I'd love to see it grow as I think we, you know, try to put out good info, but you guys are by far a very loyal following, kind of an inner circle, if you will. So I do sig significantly and sincerely appreciate that. Uh, let's get started here. All right, number one. Hi, Dave. Is there a standard round count you put through a firearm before you consider it reliable enough for carry? Uh, P.S. You need to raise. Yes, I do. Anyways... I don't have a definitive answer. I guess the, the best way I can answer it is it kind of depends. Now, I've been involved with a few different uh, cycles of duty handguns for a police department as well as rifles, things like that. And sometimes it just kind of depends on, you know, what budget you have uh, for an agency perspective. They might only have a certain dollar amount of ammunition that they can allow in time for training, things like that. But you as an individual, uh, I would just, just say a few hundred rounds at a minimum. And generally that's what I like to do. So when we issue a new handgun or a rifle or whatever, I try to you know then incorporate that into a training day where they're running a lot of drills, really kind of putting the gun through its paces in hopefully a short period of time. And then also testing it with the duty or carry ammunition. So that is another topic to kind of you know talk about a little bit is that it's one thing if you put let's just say you buy a new glock generally speaking a glock 19 probably the most popular handgun in the world is arguably likely to be very reliable out of the box okay uh, safe bet if you will trust but verify but the track record of glock 19s is generally pretty good so you put 300 rounds of 
full metal jacket, you know, 115 ball, everything is functioning great. The ejection pattern is good. The velocity of the brass is nice. Uh, it's a good consistent ejection, no function issues whatsoever. Where I've seen issues, sadly, is then people will try to, you know, go back later with their duty or carry ammunition and then they'll have an issue because that particular gun didn't like that ammo. So make sure you're also testing it with whatever ammunition you're gonna be carrying, whether that's a self-defense ammo, a duty ammo, whatever, and that applies to rifles as well. So we definitely wanna make sure we're testing that. Uh, issues that I've seen with rifles, for example, is they'll run fine with cheap 223 brass practice ammo, but put a 556 duty or self-defense load in there and they choke because that chamber wasn't a true 556 chamber. So there's issues that come up like that as well. Uh, likewise, you'll kind of develop a sense, if you will, because once you shoot more, you'll kind of get a feel of like, you know, even like one mag in, I've had a couple of guns come through where I shoot one magazine and I'm like, oh, this is a turd. Now, granted, it didn't have any stoppages. However, the cyclic rate feels sluggish. The ejection pattern is all over the place. Oh, the chipmunk. I have this chipmunk, hang on a second. Oh, this stupid bird shot. Well, I guess the chipmunk will live for another little bit. But anyways, where was I? Uh, ammunition, practice with a good quality ammunition because if you don't practice with the ammunition you're gonna carry, you're not ever gonna truly know if that you know, handgun or rifle is reliable for you. So definitely make sure you take the time. Part of the initial purchase investment should also be practice ammunition as well as carry and defense ammunition, not just for what your carry is going to be, but also to verify that it works just fine. Sorry for the distraction. Number two is from Paul. Hey Dave, hope you and the family are well during this time. Thank you very much for that. I hope you and yours are well as well. Uh, it's tough to diagnose. Had a 5.56, 1,000 rounds, no issues. Uh, it's probably overgassed as it does hit the shell deflector. A lot of ARs do and that's normal. That's actually what it's for. It'll come back, boom, and then you'll have an ejection pattern. So even on properly gassed ARs, you are likely gonna hit the shell deflector. No big deal there. Uh, but anyways, took it out. Best it would get two rounds to cycle, generally only one. Took the gas block off, cleaned it, back on, clean lube the gun. Same issue after even trying different mags. It will eject, but it won't pick up the next round. What could it be? Number one, I would try to diagnose the halves. So if you have another known good quality AR, take that upper, put it on the other one if it works. Okay, then we know it could be a lower issue. If it doesn't work, then we know it's probably the uppers. That's the common denominator and vice versa for the lower. And then if it is the lower, we wanna make sure that the buffer and spring move freely, the hammer uh, is installed correctly, hammer spring, trigger uh, fire control group is all installed correctly. Uh, if you have a bad device, believe it or not, I've seen some of those issues. If you've changed anything, well, that should be another thing. What have you changed? If you've changed something, like added an extended bolt catch or bolt release, that likely could be the culprit because I've seen some of those cause the bolt catch to raise and they drag on the bolt carrier causing some friction too. So again, diagnose upper, lower, go from there. But if it's the upper, we also want to check the bolt carrier group. I do have a video on gas key uh, fixing because we did have a popped primer in that particular video that we had to replace. And sometimes that'll happen is that it's obstructing the gas gas system. So those are some of the things you I would look for being that you already checked the gas block. I don't know if there was any signs of gas leakage around the gas block, but that's also something to check. And then uh, you can also check uh, alignment of the gas block of the gas tube, make sure none of that is damaged, kinked, if there's any obstructions or anything like that. So depending on, I've seen people like shove pipe cleaners and stuff down their gas tube. Don't do it. It's easy to get stuff stuck down there. Uh, I hope that answers that. If you have any other questions, let me know. And then his last comment was, stop smashing your burgers. No. A smash burger is a delicious delicacy. Now, maybe it's a Midwest thing, I'm not exactly sure, but it's basically where you take a good sized meatball and you smash it onto your griddle or flat top and you sear it and you have this nice, beautiful crust, you flip it over, they're amazing. I also do like a traditional grilled patty, you know, a big thick burger, the pink in the middle, I love it. But a few weeks ago for Corona Cookout Fun, I did a live video on the Facebook uh, making a smash burger and uh, yeah, but they're still juicy, they're very flavorful, I mean, they're just, they're amazing. So I, I like them both, but you can, you can have them both, it's okay. This one is from Chris. Uh, we have a couple Chris's it looks like. Chris number one has a Tika CTR 65 uh, wanting to mount a scope. Scope height recommendation as well as he's also considering the ADM SL recon mount with 20 MOA. Is that worth it? So here's the thing with precision rifle rings. 
their height is measured from the top of the base. So there's a Picatinny rail or base from the top of that to the center of the ring is how they measure the rings. Most times for precision rifle, you're gonna be looking at around an inch, give or take, with a 50 millimeter bell, maybe 1.2, something like that. Whereas most AR optic mounts are higher, they're 1.5 or higher. So it's it depending- nice to be a So if they are higher, that means that you have to have a cheek rest to maybe bring your cheek weld up to get optimal view. Now, some of the big scopes require obviously a higher ring, like the larger 56 millimeter objective, you know, things like that. But also to keep in mind that your sight over bore will change. So depending on how you're zeroing, that could also be an issue there. So generally speaking, a lot of mine, and I have, you know, 50 plus objectives uh, right around a one inch ring. Make sure you also get the correct diameter. So that's where it's kind of confusing. There's different heights, which are measured in inches, and then your scope tube diameter is generally either in one inch or in millimeters. So you have to make sure you get the correct uh, size diameter as well as the height. So well, I, I plan on doing another video on how to select the proper scope rings as well as how to properly zero a rifle because it's not just as easy as going to the range, point of aim, point of impact, you know, done. I think there's a little bit more to it than that. So future videos coming up on that. Great, great questions. Number four, what is your opinion on pistol braces versus a short barrel rifle and why? Uh, you know, he's out of range now, but the chipmunk is way over there. He's just looking at me knowing. Ugh. I hate that chipmunk. Pistol versus SBR. A few years ago, I would have said that pistols are kind of like, <laughs> just get an SBR, dude. That's lame. But I have to say the braces have come so far where they are viable. And like the SB tactical brace that I, like even this one I have on my charger, uh, this is a really nice brace. And I have a really compact pistol here that legally I can carry. I can travel across state lines. I don't have to pay $200. I don't have to wait for a tax stamp. And it works very well. So I, I gotta give credit where credit is due. SB tactical arguably really kinda set that huge tidal wave of the brace popularity. So they're doing good work. And like I said, you don't have to wait for your tax stamp and all the other pros I just mentioned. The, the big con would be if you wanted to have a short barrel rifle with a vertical foregrip, depending on the length, if it's a firearm or a short barrel rifle, obviously you can't attach that to a pistol. Uh, so there's some issues there. And I still do think a stock is superior if you're shooting a rifle, you know, versus a brace. So there's that. But travel, Federal restrictions, tax, waiting peers, all this other stuff is eliminated with a pistol. Plus, many people are able to legally carry a pistol in a vehicle or on their person, depending on their state laws, and that's a big pro as well, where several states restrict rifles in public places. So definitely some pros there. I've built a couple pistols now that I really like, that Charger being one of them. My PDX upper is on a pistol lower. I do have a video of that PDX upper and that's on a pistol lower and I really, really like it. I'm probably gonna do a couple more here as well just because they they actually are cool guns. I have one of my, uh, my Noveski is a pistol. So, you know, there's, yeah, there, there's some cool stuff with pistols now. This one is from Frank. This is from New Hampshire. Not really a QA question, uh, but an idea to tackle would be a wider than standard gun belt. So I do have a video on gun belts. I'll put a link to it up here if you're watching on YouTube, otherwise go to the webpage and type in keyword gun belt. But my setup has generally been more duty belt style setups where about that two and a quarter inch thick outer belt, then that has a Velcro liner that attaches to a trouser belt. And then the system kind of locks in place and keeps everything rock solid. I have one for kind of competition, setup and then I have one for training tactical type setup and that one really kind of mirrors my duty belt uh, which I wear at work so daily I wear a duty belt for 10 plus hours a day and I find them very comfortable so long as you have a good solid trouser belt that's set up correctly and doesn't shift and flex and things like that what he's talking about is some of the wider padded gun belts uh, like the one from high speed gear and I used to run a padded high speed gear belt uh, until I ingrew it and the thing that I didn't like about it although it was comfortable the padding is that it didn't anchor to the trouser belt or my waist. So when I would run or move, it would you know bounce up and down and I didn't like that feeling. I'd have to hold it and you know then it, it just wasn't ideal for me. So I might revisit the topic based on your suggestion. And I I'm really am curious if some of the new belts on the market have a different attachment method. The other downside with some of the high, um, not necessarily the high speed, but some of the thicker padded belts was that the belt core, if you will, 
wasn't really optimized to run certain duty holsters because it was a thinner belt. So you'd have to kind of come up with spacers or a different loop or something like that. So that's a good topic. I do appreciate that. Uh, but yeah, great suggestion. And yeah, we'll, we'll address that in the future. This is a good time to take a break and give thanks to our sponsor, Rainier Arms. The Rainier Arms Apex Club brings you this episode of the QA, and for a low yearly price of $99.99, so less than $100, you get free ground shipping, exclusive early access to all the cool new stuff, plus a discount on all of your orders. The membership fee can easily pay for itself within your first few orders, and Rainier Arms is gearing new stuff literally every week. They're getting new stuff in. Not just AR stuff, but handgun stuff, precision rifle stuff, optic stuff, shotgun stuff, and then of course, all the cool AR gear. But every time I get an email with their new products, it's just like my wish list, my drooling wish list of like, oh, I want that, I want that, I want that. They have a new distribution facility in the Midwest, so they are shipping coast to coast much faster. I'm getting stuff literally sometimes next or second day, which is awesome. And I just love the guys at Rainier Arms. So if you're looking to get all the coolest, newest stuff at a discount, free ground shipping, for a low price of $99.99, check out the Rainier Arms Apex Club. Back to the questions. This one is from Jesus. I just finished putting a uh, new rifle and I want to zero my iron sights, but I'm a bit confused on where I should hold the front sight. Also, what's a good distance to zero? Uh, 50 yards would be my recommendation. Most people with iron sights can generally shoot pretty solid at 50 yards, so then you can get a good group and you can make appropriate corrections. Sadly, I've seen some people shoot at 100 yards and their group is like this big, so even when they're shooting five, I don't know if like these three are the better of the group or if these two, or if it's just a kind of a mod podge combination where we have to kind of shoot and correct and go from there. So 50 yards is generally pretty good for ballistics. Your trajectory out to about 225 is pretty solid where you can just, you know, hold center. And then the most your rounds will ever be off point of aim is a couple of inches out to about 225. So that's good. Now, as far as where you should be holding, the front sight should be centered in the rear sight. So we're holding, I like to hold at the top of the front sight. So if I was shooting a, let's just say a, a circle bullseye type target, I would split that target generally right in half with the top horizontal surface of the front sight splitting it. So it's right in the middle and then my, uh, that is obviously centered in my rear sight. So that's what I do. Uh, maybe I'll do a video coming up on like zeroing iron sights, a, a dedicated video where I can put up some graphics and things like that, and then kind of showing how to sight in AR iron sights. I think that's a great, great idea. I do have a video coming up on zeroing like a precision rifle optic or a scope. Uh, that would also apply to like an LPVO. So that's, I think, maybe a good dedicated video as well. So great, great question. This is from uh, Quentin, number seven. Uh, long time viewer, several time question asker. So great to see you back on the show. When buying a used gun from an individual, is there a way to check if it's ever been stolen? So first things first, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a rant here. And believe me, I'm not perfect at this either. I buy a gun, a used gun or whatever, something cool, and I always forget to like write it down. Guys, document your stuff. Okay, everybody has a smartphone these days. Take pictures and then keep a little spreadsheet of make, model, serial number, accessories, uh, accessories, serial numbers, like the scope serial numbers, make models, all that stuff. As much information as you could have, the better, and keep track of that, along with the value, purchase information, things like that. Not just for if there was an issue of theft, but also if you had a fire or damage and you needed that information for insurance, it's also very, very helpful. But sadly, you'd be surprised how many theft calls I go on where a firearm is stolen. Hey, what can you tell me about that stolen firearm? Yeah, it was an old Remington 12 gauge. Okay, what model? Yeah, I don't know. Do you have a serial number? No. We can't enter it as stolen unless we have a serial number. And the only way law enforcement is generally going to find a firearm is if they run the serial number. So they do a search warrant or they find a suspicious gun or whatever, they run the serial number and that's when it is entered in a national database, but only if they have the serial number. So make sure you're documenting that stuff. Now to answer your question, uh, you'll probably have to reach out to your local law enforcement agency. Some I'm sure will probably be more helpful than others. Pawn shops are required to check, generally speaking, when they take in items that they are stolen. However, firearm dealers are not. So are there some shady dealers out there who are probably buying suspicious or stolen guns? Yeah, there probably sadly is. However, there's not generally a requirement for them to run every gun. So it might be on you. Call the local sheriff, law enforcement agency, and just say, hey, I'm looking to buy a used gun. I'd like to verify it's not stolen. Here's the make model serial number and see if they'd run it for you. If it is stolen, then obviously you have a new set of issues. 
Is the person you're buying it from the thief? Did they buy the stolen gun? Or are they just another innocent third party where they you know, bought a stolen gun on knowing it? Oh, the chipmunk's back. It's hiding right behind a chair. Yeah! So yeah, call your local law enforcement agency. Number eight is from Jesus. Uh, Jesus, I combined a couple of your questions into one. The first one was, what should you carry on an IFAC? And then the second one was, what do you think are necessary medical equipment for an IFAC on a plate carrier or battle belt? Sorry for sending so many questions. Hey, you don't have to apologize. I love it when people send a lot of questions. That's exactly what this is for. So IFAC, individual first aid kit. Some people call it a blowout kit. Some people call it a bleeder kit. Some people call it a IFAC. Some people call it medical gear, trauma gear, first aid gear, whatever. So my experience is I used to be an EMT. I did a little bit of time in the back of an ambulance. Most of my time was a glorified first responder. So I'd be a police officer slash EMT, which basically meant instead of a standard first aid kit, I had a bigger first aid kit and I could do a little bit more before the ambulance arrived. Worked out well uh, when I worked in kind of a rural area, things like that. So that being said, I have a little bit of experience but most of what we're gonna be carrying in an IFAC is to stop the bleeding. That's a very, very big priority. Obviously, we go back to the simple, you know, ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. Air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. If we can keep those things going on, generally we'll keep somebody alive. So we wanna have some sort of airway, nasal airway, oral airway, so we can keep air going in and out, but we also wanna stop the bleeding. Even if someone has stopped breathing for a little bit of time there's a chance we can get them back but if they bleed out uh, there's very little chance so it's a really is a combination of them both again air goes in and out blood goes round and round is one of the things that one of my uh, paramedic mentors taught me very early on and it's very true advice so we're going to generally work on stopping the bleeding tourniquets uh, packing dressing so we can pack a wound if we are unable to apply a tourniquet such as to an abdomen area or things like that uh, some hemostatic agents to stop the bleeding or help to control bleeding, different uh, packing, you know, and like I said, materials, things like that. And then also we're gonna wanna look at uh, trauma shears to access a wound, gloves, personal protective equipment. You know, that's gonna probably be the core of the IFAC without getting it to be super huge and large, you know, so it's unrealistic. You know, things that work really good are some of the purpose-built dressings, the Israeli dressings, uh, thing, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that actually I think it probably would be worth doing a dedicated video and maybe I'll bring one of my paramedic friends to kind of help out with their subject matter expertise on that. Uh, and then obviously that would be followed up. That's like your first line gear, if you will. It should be followed up with a larger support gear. So for example, when we were doing classes, all the instructors had an IFAC kit on us with an additional tourniquet on us so we could get it with either hand. We had multiple gear and then we also had a larger trauma support bag on range as well where we could uh, further life support efforts. So that's that. Now a quick thing, get some training. Take a first aid class, take a first responder class, take a trauma medicine class, tactical medicine class. They will help answer a lot of these questions because they'll show you how to use the equipment. Don't carry stuff that's beyond your scope. I've had guys show up to class and we're talking about their IFAC and they're carrying a decompression needle. I asked them like, do you know how to use that? And they're like, yeah, no, but it looked really cool and it was a part of the kit. Well, we don't just wanna be sticking needles in people's chests when we don't know what we're doing. That's a paramedic level skill, an advanced life support skill. And yes, most states offer a good Samaritan law to protect you. The reality is if you're negligent and you're doing something that you have no idea what you're doing beyond the scope of your training and something bad happens, you could still be liable, you could get sued. So even though you may have some protections you also want to make sure you're not putting yourself in a bad spot all right our last question is been wanting to get an ar in 5.56 or 223 geared towards accuracy at longer ranges 600 plus looking for a 20 inch barrel open to suggestions i think 20 is a good one i mean you can get a little bit longer and you'll gain some velocity but 20 by the time you add a muzzle device is very very reasonable so i think you're you're good there Recommendation for barrels. You're looking at Ballistic Advantage, BCM, brands or specific barrels you would recommend. P.S. If you're ever around Central Washington, can I bribe you with some Pineapple Fanta to go to the range? Absolutely. I'd love that. Uh, ice cold Pineapple Fanta will always get me there. And hopefully I'll make it out to Washington again. TriggerCon was canceled this year, but I'd like to go back. Beautiful area. Barrels that I really like. And 
Okay, I, I realize Rainier sponsors the show Rainier Arms, but their barrels are actually really, really good, and I run a lot of them. I have an 18-inch match barrel. I have an ultra match barrel. I have an ultra match 308 barrel. I've used their uh, Forge series. They make really solid barrels, and they're made by phenomenal companies. I have a little bit of insider knowledge that I'm not allowed to share. I would not hesitate to recommend a Rainier barrel. They have different grades. Their Ultra Match is obviously the most expensive. They're going to be a little bit more accurate, but their match barrels are a sweet, sweet buy. Uh, I would not hesitate to take a look at one of them. Now, you think that, oh, they're sponsoring the show. You're saying that. I'm not. I can show you, and I can tell you other people that I've recommended those barrels to that have had great success with them. So those are barrels that I would really, really look at. They have good sales as well. Uh, Criterion barrels are also very good. Bravo Company barrels are good. Uh, they make them. There's a couple companies in Wisconsin that were making them that I heard. Uh, Criterion might even be one of them if I recall correctly. But Criterion barrels are great. You can find some of those at very good prices. Uh, I've also used uh, Triarch barrels. I've been very happy with that. JP, but they're going to be a little bit more money. But man, honestly, bang for the buck, I truly do think the best barrel out there is the Rainier. And depending on what your budget is, is depending on which one you pick. They have a guarantee. I just don't think you'd go wrong with one. So that is that. You may think I'm biased, and you can go ahead and think that and post it below, whatever. But that's my honest opinion. So that being said, I'm going to run out of battery here pretty soon. Uh, let's go ahead and pick a random number. Hopefully the internet is working. I was having a little bit of issues connecting with my iPad before. Our random number generator is, if you can see that, number four. And number four is... I believe it was the first Chris. Nope, the second Chris. Chris number two. So Chris number two, I will be reaching out to you and uh, getting your contact info to send you a prize courtesy of Rainier Arms. Guys, we do have the 50K giveaway coming up. The more the channel grows, the better prizes and things we'll be able to give out. So if you like the content, please like, share, and subscribe. Tell your buddies we need more subscribers to get the channel to grow. If you want to see your question get on the show, the best way, of course, is to email us at the email address shown below, which is the QA at gunsandtactics.com. Thank you guys very much for watching and have a great day. We work really hard to make content that we hope you as a shooter would enjoy. Subscribe to our channel, check out our featured videos and playlists, and if you have a question firearms related, go ahead and send an email to the address shown on the screen to be entered into our monthly QA series.